Right, good morning, everybody. Um, thank you for taking the time out to uh, join us this morning um, on our uh, how to get the best from M365, the uh, Microsoft arrangement for the NHS. Just to go into the agenda, um, I'm going to give a brief introduction, a little bit of about uh, Bytes, etc. Um, Peter Eli from us, from our uh, uh, end user computing, he's our end user computing practice lead. Um, uh, he's going to go through um, some of our services that we can offer you around N365, and that's Byte services. Um, then we're going to move on to uh, Barry Daniels. Um, he's got 20, 20 years experience in IT, held senior positions at IBM, Rackspace, Exponential, and various other things, and his current position is CEO of Droplet. Um, the innovative container technology uh, they provide, um, decoupling applications from the underlying operating system, and uh, obviously giving a lot of security around that. Uh, he's going to be going through a case study about NHS Tay side of used droplet, how, how they've saved money, etc. And we're also have, going to have Michelle Laverick on there, who's going to be running a demonstration for us as well. Um, we've got Michael Latimer from ISOSEC, um, so they're all about NHS auth authentication, uh, cloud based identity and access solutions, um, helping over 120 healthcare organizations um, actually uh, to make uh, critical systems faster, simpler, and safer. Um, so he's the CEO of ISOSEC, um, and uh, um, yeah, great work with the NHS that they're doing. Uh, what we're going to be doing, obviously at the end, but also uh, considering uh, the day it is today, uh, 11th of November, we'll be pausing at 11 o'clock just to observe the two minute silence for remembrance. So um, I'll let everybody know when their time is coming up there. Okay, so um, just a little bit about Bytes first. Um, I've, I've seen all the people who are attending. I think I've spoken to quite a lot of you guys. So I'm Chris Swanee. I'm the Director of Public Sector at Bytes. Um, and uh, I've been heavily involved in um, both. I, I manage the Windows 10 agreement um, for the NHS. We're doing that in partnership with um, NHS Digital and Department of Health. Um, and I'm a pretty much main, major point of call for that. Um, but we've also got on attendance on the call um, our NHS um, account management team, um, so they'll all be familiar to you as well. So a little bit about Bytes. Uh, we've been growing great over the last few years, 422 staff across six UK offices. Uh, last year's revenue was uh, actually it's more than 470 million, um, but our public sector revenue um, is a, a very huge part of our overall business, uh, 260 million pounds in the past 12 months. Uh, we cover Obviously, NHS, we support over 200 NHS organizations directly with their licensing and services requirements. Uh, we also have presence in central and local government as well as various other areas of public sector. Uh, as I mentioned before, we manage the Windows 10 agreement uh, with the NHS, and we've also been helping a lot of organizations navigate N the new N365 arrangement, um, which provides extra discounts for key um, Microsoft products, um, enabling standardization across the NHS. Um, we don't just do Microsoft, we've got top accreditations with over 100 technology partners and we're very proud of the fact that we're a nice company, uh, everybody loves working here of course, and we're the Sunday Times best one of the Sunday Times best companies to work for in 2020. Um, Microsoft is a large part of our business and, and this is what we're talking about today. Um, we are um, leaders uh, with Microsoft's number one cloud partner for Azure and Office 365. Um, obviously, what that means is, you know, we don't just sell a lot of it. We've got a lot of services around um, those platforms, um, helping organizations migrate to those platforms and make the best use of it and also optimize those platforms um, in order to build a cost effective um, and performant um, solution for organizations. Um, so, uh, you know, 2 million Windows 10 deployments. We've helped so many organizations move to Windows 10 ourselves with partners. Um, so we've got great experience there. Um, we've got 120 Microsoft certified professionals within our team. Um, we use partners as well to help uh, deployment. So there's 20 Microsoft de deployment partners. Uh, we've got our own internal Microsoft dedicated services team. Um, and we also provide a lot of other resellers as well. 
So what do we do? Um, obviously the licensing piece, uh, a, lot, a lot of you um, guys on the call, you use this for your soft like software licensing requirements, enterprise subscription agreements, etc. cetera. Um, but we manage the whole life cycle of software licensing agreements. Uh, we help with vendor negotiation, consolidation of agreements to help, help build cost efficiencies into your organizations. Um, we're a huge cloud business as well. So we are able to help support organizations. We've got technical, technical consultants there, architectures, uh, architects, uh, helping optimize um, and automate um, your cloud services. Um, a big, another big part of our business is our cyber cybersecurity business. Um, quite a long time ago, we, we um, purchased a company called Security Partnerships. Um, and now that is fully formed within our organization. So our cyber consulting uh, division um, is helping organizations, you know, maintain their security, um, identify and mitigate threats and uh, resolve those threats as well. Um, modern workplace, the end user computing part of it. Um, so we've got, um, you know, managing software as a service there um, and pro productivity and collaboration, unified endpoint management and uh, Peter Eli is, is um, a major part of that um, offering for us. We also do uh, work in the data center as well. So when you're looking about infrastructure and virtualization, um, storage management, backup management, disaster recovery, um, we're able to provide a lot of services around that. Um, and then if uh, organizations need help in actually skilling up their staff, be it their technical staff or front end user staff, then we've got our learning services division who can, can arrange and provide a wide range of courses um, to help um, ensure that people are productive, skilled, um, and uh, are able to manage the infrastructure structure that they're um, running for organization, their organizations. Um, so N365 is all really a rename of Microsoft 365 um, and we're able to offer quite a right, wide range of deployment services on that. So if you're looking to actually make the use of your investment, make most use of your investments, uh, get that technology out into your organization, get people using it, then there's a lot of services that we can actually provide um, to actually help you deploy that and manage it and maintain it. Uh, we can do proof of concepts for you. Um, um, and we can also, we're, we're also Microsoft Premier support backed as well. And uh, we're also a Microsoft Fast Track partner as well. So we're able to help provide paid for consultancy in certain areas um, to help bring the costs of uh, migration down for you. Just a quick about Microsoft N365. It comprises of a wide range of technologies and depending on the package that you've opted for or going to go for, uh, I'm not gonna go through this whole slide, um, but there's quite a lot of areas there that people are well familiar with. You know, the Office 365 piece of it and OneNote, Teams, etc. this is all included, um, but there's many, many other technologies. Um, that can bring um, cost, efficiency, cost efficiencies to your organizations and um, simplification of processes as well. Um, and we're able to support organizations on the whole complete range of these um, technologies um, to help you make the most of your investment. N365 very basically is, is a range of technologies. I'm sure that everybody's seen these slides similar, similar to these before. Um, they, these were used when N365 were announced. We, we, we were on a number of um, presentations and webinars with NHS Digital directly and we did our own um, <clears throat> but it basically you know there's two sides of the N365 or two ways um, uh, that people are using N365 either by using the shared tenant with NHS Digital or by having it on their own local tenant either which way you're still getting access to those technologies um, it's all backed uh, it's all based on the um, uh, paid for office 365 e3 restricted license which gives you a basic amount of technology um, in order to build upon you know, going from just um, just going through office 365 through to the full emns suite so with the shared tenant that the office 365 restricted is provided for you as is paid for um, centrally for the local tenant as well um, if you have any questions about the um, functionality of any of these, do speak to your account manager, do let us know. We're able to help you out um, and identify opportunities for you whereby you, know, you can make the most of these technologies. So what we're gonna do now is I'm gonna move on. Um, I'm gonna pass over to Peter Eli. As I said before, fill out the survey at the end. 
we'll be pausing at uh, 11 o'clock uh, for a couple of minutes um, and any questions that you have pop them in the chat facility um, and uh, I'll look forward to speaking to you soon. Peter over to you. Thank you Chris. Um, so welcome everybody. I mean the intention today is not only to update you on N365 as, uh, as Chris done well today uh, but also to showcase some of the technology partners that Byte are working with that are really helping other NHS organisations to achieve better security, better governance and, and more management of applications and access to those applications. So the first two areas are, are something that we are going to cover as part of this um, uh, webinar today. Uh, we, we'll see droplet computing and ISOSEC and, and see how they are helping in those specific two areas. But we're seeing a vast number of other requirements uh, from our customers in the NHS. Uh, requirements to secure data on a screen so that only those that are authorised to view the data on screen are able to view it. Um, it is being a, a big thing, especially in the, the, the current environment that uh, people are being forced to work in. So if you have, uh, as we've seen in many occasions, uh, consultants, nurses, doctors who walk away from their PC, we now have technologies that can instantly lock the screen if it detects they've walked away. Um, or if anyone appears over the shoulder of the person accessing that data, then it also blurs the data. And that's becoming key in the remote working environment we're being forced down right now. We're also seeing uh, demand for mobile device migration into uh, the N365 tenancy that's been purchased. So how do you get devices that might be enrolled in AirWatch or even another Intune tenancy into N365 without having to hard wipe the device and disrupting the end user's device? Uh, well, we're working with the technology that can help with this. So, you know, there's other issues that we're seeing around connectivity in Azure to HSCN or even making printing easier, which is obviously still a challenge in the NHS. So if these are areas in which you're seeing a gap, um, I think that the message here is that we can assist. Our, our knowledge of the NHS and the challenges you face um, uh, really can be helped with our engagement. Uh, we're able to provide that free independent advice by means of an advisory workshop. So we can sit down and go through these challenges with you and help provide that advice that is completely agnostic and completely free of charge. Um, but if you'd like to take advantage of that or any of the technologies being highlighted today, please let us know via the feedback form at the end. So on to the fun stuff. Um, I'm, I'm pleased to be able to introduce Barry Daniels and Michelle Laverick from Droplet Computing who are uh, taking the way applications can be utilized within your environment to a new level. Uh, I'll let them explain more, but Barry, over to you. Excellent, just hold for one second while I get control of the screen, hopefully. Excellent, thank you. So. Droplet computing, we've done quite a lot of work with in NHS Trust and our main reference site being uh, NHS Tayside at the moment, where the challenge that they had was uh, around Windows 7, um, being locked to Windows 7 with certain applications that wouldn't be able to move forward. We've since done some freedom uh, of information requests across all of NHS Trust and found that uh, one in three devices still across all NHS are still locked to Windows 7. And, and I'm guessing that you guys uh, on this call are seeing uh, a similar problem, that you're either being locked to expensive equipment upgrades um, for MRI scanners because the software that drives it or other equipment that, that's being driven that drives it is um, on an older operating system because that's all the software that runs them is allowed to operate on. And so it means a, a massive shift and a, a massive cost upgrade to uh, a new machine to, to get around that issue in a lot of cases. Um, we were able to, as a container technology here, we're able to address those issues. We're able to divorce the application away from the underlying operating system allowing you to upgrade to the latest and greatest operating system and then delivering back your application via our app, via our container. We're very security focused uh, around that. Uh, another big part of what uh, NHS Tayside were able to save costs on was they were being forced down a route from certain sort of ISVs where the upgrade for Windows 10, they had a Windows 10 version, there was no great feature 
benefits for moving forward to that new version. It was just a case of they were charging them over the odds to move to a Windows 10 compatible version. Um, what we've been able to do in our secure container is containerize up those applications, allowing the Windows 7 um, version to be able to operate securely on Windows 10. When we say we're a, a container technology, everyone instantly thinks Docker. And Docker is very much for a server-side world built in the modern uh, application suite that would um, only be able to be accessed by um, modern applications to scale and allow you to control costs. We're not Docker. We're very much a client-side container, um, and we sit with divorcing that application away from the underlying operating system and then delivering it back where it's needed. It could be Windows 10 or other platforms as well. So it makes us ideal for those legacy applications that you're all challenged with at the moment and are locking you down to not being able to move forward to um, Windows 10. And that can hold back some of your N365 deployments uh, as well as I, I understand it. And also have a big impact on things like DSP toolkit. Uh, assessments or Cyber Essentials or Cyber Essentials Plus accreditations. So we've been successful in enabling uh, NHS Tayside to actually achieve their, their Cyber Essentials accreditation from the work that we've done with them in securing their applications. We don't need any server-side infrastructure, so there's no back-end infrastructure. So from a cost perspective, a lot of what you'll see in application delivery um, platforms like a Citrix or a VMware, where they deliver via VA, VDI or DAS, there's a massive amount of server-side back-end infrastructure required. We don't need any of that. It deploys to the endpoint. You put all your policies, all your governance uh, inside a, a secured container and deliver that out to the, to the endpoint. So it scales particularly well um, because you, we use the power of the endpoint to actually drive the applications. Um, that means we can work offline as well um, because we deliver direct to the end. So if you're in more rural areas or have some challenges around applications where connectivity would be a challenge for you, um, it's not a challenge from a, a droplet world. Obviously, if there's a dependency back to a, a database, that would need to be locally cached to work. But in the main, uh, every application you put inside a droplet container will work offline. Um, I will go into security a little bit later. We've been fortunate enough uh, as a company of been established since 2014 and along our journey, we've managed to win a couple of awards by the British Computer Society, which is quite nice. Um, so the UK uh, Innovation and Entrepreneurship Award and then a double winner two years in a row in a new category um, with the current Emerging Technology of the Year. And we're actually a finalist in this year's awards for Specialist Vendor of the Year. So this is the challenge that, that you all will face at the moment, and this, this will be the problem that you will typically see. So there is a, a dependency normally by these older applications uh, on the .NET or a certain version of, uh, of Java where they needed a certain IE version or a certain uh, .NET plugin that we can take care of for you. We put all the dependencies inside our container, allowing that to run and then deliver it back to where it needs to, to work. So Windows 10 in the majority of cases within the NHS. Um, we don't sequence, we don't capture, we don't change the support model of the application. So we actually just give it a, a bomb proof wrap around um, the outside of the container so nothing can get in. We still interact within your infrastructure and allow um, that full integration within what you're using on your modern application side within the network and still able to do that securely. Um, and just to reiterate again, no back-end server infrastructure is required to do that. So this is what we what we currently do. We can port our container across a multitude of devices. So we can easily work within a Windows 10 environment, within a Google Chrome environment, within a Linux environment, or an Apple environment. And the consistency of application is given across all of those different platforms to the end user. So once you put your 
your application set and what you want to deliver out inside a droplet container, you can literally scale deployment out very easily across multiple platforms and the end user would get uh, an identical experience across those different uh, platforms. So just get access to their applications, which is the important part. Um, from a, 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 we also deliver to uh, cloud. So if your journey would be taking you to an Amazon Workspaces or a, a Windows Virtual Desktop or a VMware or a Citrix uh, estate, we actually have some referenceability within BT on a, on a Citrix estate. What they had was Presentation Server 4.5. Their applications wouldn't run on that older version of Citrix. What they were able to do was containerize their application inside Droplet, move their Citrix farm estate to the latest version, and then deliver back that application via a Droplet computing container. Also, AppStream is available, as well as uh, the Citrix uh, Zen app. This is the construct of, of how um, Droplet computing uh, will, will actually work. So across the, the middle here, we have what we call our Droplet computing application. And in a Windows world, which we typically see in the NHS, it will be a, an MSI executable or an XE or an MSIX sort of uh, application. Um, in the Linux world, we can do DM, um, sorry, not DMG, sorry, RPM or .dev file, and uh, Mac world, it would be a .dmg. So we get the, the executable for the different platform, and that's our translation layer. So that enables us to uh, communicate from our container back to the, the host device, and everything we do talks through that host device out to the network. And then attached to that is our container technologies. That plugs in. There's a DCIX that can be joined, and that's for the really old stuff that you may still have hanging around on Windows XP or DOS applications that may still exist within your environment. So you would use that container for the maximum compatibility for your applications for that. Or the DCIM, which we more commonly see, which is the journey from Windows 7 to Windows 10, enabling you to, to put all of those applications inside our container, secure them down, put the dependencies in, put your governance in, your security policies, lock a user down to what they can and can't do, and then deploy that out to where it's actually needed. You create it once, you deploy a thousand times, multiple thousand times, it infinitely scales. So from a security point of view, we don't just say that we're secure by design, we actually go out to, um, to the NCC group PLC on the last pen test. So for each version of our software, we have a, a pen test done on our container. And we have multiple um, pen tests that occur within our clients as well, within their own environments. And we do recommend that, that you do that because obviously best security practice, your environment is unique in each case. Um, so what they were, what they actually did with the NCC group is they took a, um, a container, we had IE8 in there, we had old Java 1.6 in there, some very vulnerable things, um, and they couldn't crack into from outside of the host into uh, our container. So they then took a compromised host, uh, took a compromised Windows 10 machine, um, and then still tried to crack into our container from that, and again, couldn't crack into the container. They did bring up one thing on the pen test report, which we can share with you guys if you want. Um, and that was that I know we can't crack into your container, but should have we been able to, we noticed that all outbound ports are open on your container technology. Um, so it could be seen as a, a threat. So we took that on board and we added into our latest version um, a firewall for outbound traffic as well. By default, we block all inbound traffic. Um, but we did allow outbound traffic, and now we have a stateful firewall in place, which Michelle will show you on on a demo. Now I'm conscious that 11 o'clock is is uh, on the horizon here, so I'm going to talk for a couple of minutes more, if that's that's okay, um, just to uh, just to see us to the uh, observance of the 11 o'clock, rather than Michelle being stopped midway. Um, so so within that that pen test, we added that. Firewall. So now you can configure down to the nth um, how secure you want this container to be. You can lock down what and look at your application in detail to see what's allowed, what's not allowed, um, and and actually totally bomb proof that down. I'm going to hand back to um, 
to the presenters now so that we can all observe the 11 o'clock and then I think Michelle will, will got dive a into a demo. We've got a couple of more minutes to go yet. Yeah, see, I'm, I'm good. I'm good. Okay, let's talk about pricing then. So from a, <laughs> from a subscription point of view, um, we, we typically in NHS actually use a, a device license rather than a per user per month, but we can actually, with the shift patterns around how uh, obviously staff in the NHS work within shifts and they're multi-using on, on individual devices. So we actually take a, a model to, to NHS that allows you to license per device rather than just per user. Um, so that the cost efficiencies are, are there. Because there's no back-end infrastructure, because there's um, there's nothing on that side, where uh, Bytes fully lists us on um, G Cloud. Uh, I forget what the latest version is. I think it's G Cloud 12 is the latest. Yeah, that's uh, G Cloud, G -Cloud. 12 at the moment. Um, so there is a lot listed to uh, see, and you can actually see the commercial side that Bytes offer uh, on G Cloud 12 by searching for that. And now I'm at user demonstration time and we've got, what, a minute or so to go for our observance? Yeah, I think um, just to probably do the introduction to the demonstration. Um, so, Michelle Laverick will take you through a uh, demonstration. Perhaps we do the, the switch around of the screens now so that Michelle can uh, get her screen up and running. And she'll take you through some of the ease of which um, it is to use droplet computing. She'll show you how to install applications in and the dependencies there. She'll show you some of the things that I've spoken about now to do with the security, the firewall, um, and we'll, uh, we'll finish up there. Okay, so just a reminder, if you've got any questions at all, uh, please do post those in the chat box. Uh, we'll endeavour to answer those. Uh, the slides will be circulated shortly after the um, shortly after the webinar because we are recording it. Um, but before we go through the demonstration, can we just pause for a, a couple of minutes uh, just to to remember the fallen? Thank you. Thank you very much, everybody, for that. Um, and uh, we will now resume. Thank you. I think it's Michelle now. Thank you very much. So um, what I've done um, before we started was load up our container and our software. Installing our software takes about five or ten minutes um, and obviously then we install applications inside the container. The application that you're seeing in front of you is just our front end that we use to, if you like, publish applications and control what the users can and cannot see. In most cases, end users will have this application minimized to the system tray. There's our little droplet logo. And what they'll interact with is something called a droplet seamless application. We automatically create shortcuts on the end user's desktop. And so from the user's perspective, they have really no idea that the legacy app that they're inter interacting with has been containerized. So it's a very, very simple uh, front end to the, the system. And our aim really is to get out of the way and give the impression that these applications are running natively in Windows 10 or in Apple Mac or in Chromebook, but actually they are being containerized inside our application. One of the common things that have come up with our work with NHS Tayside is demands for device support. So we do have a USB version of our product and we're using that currently with a range of different scanners inside the NHS. So as an example, I've got a HP scanner here. We notice that scanners are not just used with diagnostics equipment, but they're often used um, with the process of coming around through a diagnosis where somebody might take a scan and add a comment on that, send it on to another person and a team of people work on that particular end user, um, so or that patient rather. So the USB uh, component is built into the technology and you can do the same kind of things you would have done with a uh, physical machine, you can do inside the container as well. During Barry's uh, little chat there, Barry mentioned some of the security functions that we have. A security perimeter sits round outside the container, which presents anybody trying to gain access to it. But we also have security controls that control what traffic is allowed outside of the container. 
So typically our customers will um, block everything except port 80 and 443 to get to some legacy web server or block everything and just allow access to some legacy database, perhaps listing on a legacy Microsoft SQL server, for example. And it's from our work with the NCC group that we've started to introduce these sorts of controls. A common question that people do ask is, how does software get installed inside the container? Usually the container is locked, as you can see here, and all the end user can do is launch applications either from the main application tile interface or from these shortcuts that I've shown you on the, the desktop. The way uh, the system administrator installs software is by first unlocking the container. And when the container is unlocked, it exposes a series of controls that the administrator can use to install software. For example, getting to Windows Explorer, uh, to download software or get to a software repository on the network. Incidentally, you might also see that I can see the local drives of my machine here. Droplet Seamless Apps comes with a whole series of different features, such as bi-directional clipboard, multi-monitor support, automatic redirection of printers, USB support, as well as redirection for audio, which might be of interest for people who have dictaphones and actually record their, their views on whatever they're, they're doing. To save a little bit of time, I've already downloaded a tiny piece of software uh, from our system, which I can use to start an install. So the critical thing here to mention about software and how it finds itself into the container is there's no sequencing, recording, or capturing process required to install software. As long as you have access to your original media, and the licenses, and also you know what dependencies it has, what version of Java or .NET it has. Very much installing software into the container is just like installing any software into a conventional PC. So if I have a look at my hard drive now inside the container, you can see I've got a copy of Notepad++, and that software has been installed to my system. All the administrator needs to do then is make sure that an application tile is set up for this particular user. So that basically means specifying a friendly name and then uh, a name for the executable, optionally an icon, depending on whether you want to supply one or not. And when we create that application in our tile interface, it will automatically drop a icon on the desktop as well. And once I'm done with my installation, all I need to do is lock the container and we're back to a kind of read-only environment from within which the user can run their application. So we're hoping this seamless experience will help drive adoption. And we're hoping that this seamless experience will make it that users will just accept that the application is, is just running and not even really be aware that Droplet is being used as the delivery mechanism for these, these applications. Um, there are lots of use cases within the NHS. Uh, we're currently working uh, around the System 1 uh, application, which is used by uh, GPs especially. Uh, we've also done some work inside the NHS around the internal pharmacy applications that are used when people actually get uh, their medication dispensed internally from a pharmacy inside the NHS. So we work very, very closely with our NHS partners. Um, the, our latest bit of development has been around ensuring that people who are sharing the same machine in the same uh, shift and are using the switch user feature within Windows to switch very quickly from one application to another, that droplet seamless applications work in that kind of environment we do recognize that the NHS has some unique challenges and is an organization that works with technology in a, in a way that the vast majority of commercial businesses don't. But I'm conscious of the time and we do have other people uh, coming up to- Michelle, yeah. just a quick question. Uh, we've had a question come through. What happens if you need to patch the, the application on the droplet container? Um, one way to do that is by uh, just using the internal update mechanisms of the software. We do support joining the container to a domain. That's actually quite common within the NHS because so many applications 
require a domain-based logon to Active Directory. Once the container is part of your Active Directory domain, just like any other computer, you can use your existing software tools to push, so push software into the container, but also push updates. Does that answer the question? I, I hope so. <laughs> and also, also, is it is it simulating the operating system like XP or 2003? Um, that's a very good question. Um, there's basically three models for doing this. There's virtualization, there's emulation, and there's containerization. And you can kind of see containerization as being a hybrid of emulation and virtualization mashed up together. That would be a very simple way of doing it. But we actually use the genuine Windows kernel and the genuine application DLLs, the genuine Windows uh, software. We're not emulating a Windows environment as would be the case on Linux with something like Wine, for example. The reason we've gone down that particular route is that it drives up compatibility, which is our key goal. You, you could see really three pillars to what we're doing. We're about compliance, we're about security, and we're about compatibility. And if you bring those three things together, it then means that legacy applications can persist safely on the NHS network without them potentially being a vulnerability, which has been obviously an, an issue in the past. So I guess what makes us different from virtualization is a virtualization vendor sells you a VM. Um, they leave it to you to install an operating system and they leave it to you to install their apps. So we're creating a very fast on-ramp in which all of that work is being done by the containerization process. And all you, all you have to do is focus on installing your applications and making sure that they work properly. Thanks. Just one last question before we move on, and then if there's any other questions that come through for yourselves, we'll come cover those at the end. But we presume that users can still save files to network drives once they're in Droplet. Yes, most definitely. Um, right. You could still map network drives within the container manually if you wanted to. If you turn on our uh, host device redirection features, any drive letters, whether they're network or C drive, are automatically presented inside the, the container. So if I did file and open, for example, the C and U drives are actually um, my C drive and my uh, USB drive. But if I had a Z drive and a H drive, those drive letters would appear in here as well. Great. There's been a great seal of questions. There's a few more questions come through, but I think uh, we'll cover those off at the end. Um, thank you. Thank you. Is that you done, Michelle? That's me done. OK, I think now we're going to go over to Michael, Michael Latimer from ISASEC. Great. Um, uh, thanks very much. I, I presume uh, I've got control, so uh, uh, I'll give us a while. Thanks. Thanks, everybody, for joining the webinar. Uh, a special thanks to uh, our friends uh, and colleagues uh, at Bytes for uh, uh, both organising this and uh, inviting us along. Um, and thanks also to our, our friends um, at Droplet for, for um, uh, their presentation, which was fascinating, actually. Um, yeah, uh, I just wanted to um, uh, introduce myself. Uh, I'm Michael Latimer from ISASEC. Um, um, what we want to do is just like run through um, um, if you like, what we're up to, how we play uh, into the world of Microsoft. And um, if anybody uh, kind of doesn't know what we do, then you know, this is a great opportunity to be, able to be able to show you a bit more. It says trying to move the slides on. Just let me just try. That's great. Sorry about that. So just a little bit about our business. Um, I suspect we're a software business. We're based in Manchester. Uh, our only um, customer is the NHS and the NHS ecosystem. So, so we have laser focus on um, our, our UK healthcare. Um, as of today, we have over 120 NHS organizations um, as customers. We have over 150,000 users of our software within the NHS every day, uh, and that's growing up, up rapidly. What we do is really work primarily in the space of identity and access management. So, you know, how do you get access as an NHS user to our systems and information that requires a, a probe and identity? Um, and, you know, really that's, that's all that we do. And that plays out to an overall uh, empowerment of, of how our, our users can, can um, uh, organize and get secure access to their systems you know, anytime, anywhere on, and on any device. So that, in a, a nutshell, is what, is what ISISEC does. Um, it's, it's, uh, um, it's been a 16-year journey for us. Um, so we, we've had a lot of experience and we have a lot of domain expertise in this, in this area. 
Um, um, in terms of, of how we've moved on as an organization, you know, you know, I said we really focused on the cloud. Uh, it's it's where the future is for all of us, uh, as we know. And you know, all of ISSEC's um, solutions have a cloud element or are delivered from a cloud-based service. So it's um, very, very much about um, um, how we can make it easy for our customers to adopt um, uh, our solutions without having to make any significant changes um, at the customer end. So that's very, very important to us. Um, you know, it's 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 a myriad of uh, systems, applications, and ecosystems that operate in the NHS. You know, we all know that every organisation um, it's different. Whether it's uh, 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 an acute organisation, a community uh, trust, a uh, 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 primary care, a uh, uh, CCG, a CSU, uh, a group of GP practices, everybody's kind of got something a little bit different. You know, there are common themes. But the flavors are, are are often sort of accented what what we really try to do is to come up with solutions that embrace uh, uh, you know all ecosystems and and how they operate so basically when ISISEC comes into play it's it's an easy adoption it, it's it's easy for our customers to take what we do and uh, I think you know we we primarily play or the vast majority of what ISISEC does is uh, in tandem with 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 Microsoft, it's it's plainly, uh, you know, the the platform are, are of choice for the NHS. So we we engineer our, our products primarily to to adapt to 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 the Microsoft world, and it, it plays out a little bit beyond that uh, in terms of some of the other things that we do um, uh, um, um, have an impact in terms of things like password reset, um, uh, Windows AD. So basically. You know, I just said we're very, very uh, much plugged into the um, into the Microsoft world, um, and um, a difficulty for any organisation is like security and you know how do they get people you know accessing the right systems you know securely but but easily. So what we focus on is how can we introduce consumer grade um, software and applications and solutions that that uh, 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 allow users to have a really uh, modern, um, simple, um, shiny digital experience, but at the same time, uh, uh, sorry, at the same time, are able to maintain, um, you know, you know, the required levels of security within the, the uh, uh, NHS. So we work really hard at kind of marrying all of that together, so that our customers can get, you know, um, secure access for their people, but at the same time can make it easy. Um, and the thing we see is 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 ever changing platforms and ecosystems that can make it sort of difficult for um, our customers to to sort of change technology or can um, uh, you know um, in the worst scenarios can make some technology sort of not work. So everything that we do is about sort of uh, embracing the change. So when our customers move from sort of one one platform or ecosystem over to another one, that I said can just follow them. You know, it, it, it's just really really easy to do and that that's played out as an example with um, BDI you know that's that's the thing that's sort of um, 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 bit by bit sort of changing the face of the NHS um, and we basically made everything that we do sort of agnostic for 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 that move from a, um, a, a, a fat PC for one of a better term over to a, a, a virtual sort of desktop environment um, and that that's um, encapsulated with with um, a lot of the work we've done with Bytes, you know, who who are strong advocates for helping their customers in the NHS change over um, um, uh, over to VDI as well as uh, other systems. You know, so, so um, although I suspect you have a, a number of uh, uh, of our solutions um, around the density and our access management, the one you know we just wanted to focus on, we we obviously haven't got a lot of time. Is um, our virtual smart card? Um, uh, this is a solution we launched the NHS almost three years ago, and it's um, one that's really helped to change the way that our NHS um, users are accessing um, information, in particular information that um, uh, requires a um, uh, a spine authentication. So we um, listened at that time to a lot of our customers who said, you know, the uh, use of physical smart cards was a real challenge. 
um, not only in how they're sort of, um, if you like, uh, produced and issued, but the overall management of them um, and the overhead of them um, and some of the uh, um, shortcomings that you find when you've got you know, uh, sometimes uh, thousands of these uh, plastic cars in an organization, how do you manage them? So what Eisentech have done is, is we uh, created the virtual smart car. Uh, in essence, um, it takes all the great things about the physical smart car, but has you know, the credentials of those held, you know, obviously um, not, not on a physical car, in a, a virtual smart car service. And it's been an evolution um, uh, um, for us where we've um, enhanced the product. We've done a lot of work with NHS Digital. We're still doing that. To, to basically really help the NHS to sort of take this virtual smart card into the mainstream. So we started with obviously only a few customers three years ago and uh, have now built that up. Uh, and we expect, uh, you know, us as an organization to have over 200 organizations um, using virtual smart cards by Easter of next year. So adoption's really speeding up. But what it's all about is, you know, how do you make life easier for the users who don't have a, a plastic smart card you you're you're able to safely and securely get into um, your systems um, clinical information with a, a virtual smart card instead of the physical one so i'm just trying to move on to the next slide too many uh, apologies so so you know there there are lots of benefits to organizations um you know they vary from one 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 to the other but they're easy to use, they're easy to, um, to issue, they can be issued by self-service, so people don't need to come in and physically collect them or have them posted out. That, that, that's a real big win. But they obviously save sort of time for kind of everybody uh, um, in terms of the issuance process all the way through to the users, um, uh, not having to have a, a physical card or them not having to have a card reader and some of the difficulties associated with that. And also our overall service provides um, our customers with a, 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 a very high degree of information audit trail, information governance on the use um, of the virtual smart cards at a, a, a minute level if required. So, so in essence, um, um, it's very easy to, to, to sort of um, have a look at how each and every virtual smart card has been used and by whom and to um, ensure that obviously there's, there's some really uh, good IG available for that. Um, you know, here's um, a quote. This, this was actually from Tom Davison. Uh, Tom was actually a, a, our first major customer of a virtual smart card. So basically a, a, a trailblazer for it. And you know, his view is it's completely uh, transformed his organization. It, it's, it's allowed them to move away from physical cards um, they have uh, close to um, uh, 4,000 users of virtual smart cards. You know, you know, they don't use physical smart cards anymore. And you know, it's um, um, one, one of many great success stories that we, we hear about from our, our customers. I just wanted to give you some um, examples of how it kind of plays out in the different areas. And this is just, just three customers, obviously, um, of many. But when we look at... Um, our, our larger customers like Bart's Health, you know, who have over 15,000 ISIS set users, uh, they basically were able to um, accelerate the issue of virtual smart cards um, uh, under COVID. Uh, it, uh, it made sense to them. So they basically just, just really hit the button and got, got uh, as many virtual smart cards as they needed issued um, very, very quickly. Um, we were able to issue hundreds and hundreds literally per day to to sort of remove any of the additional strain they have with physical cards. And it's been a, a massive success. They, they are actually um, on BDI um, and, and, and it's played out really well. Um, in terms of a um, uh, primary care organization, um, Midlands and Lakes CSU and umbrella organization to a number of uh, CCGs, you know, they've worked with us uh, over the past three years to get virtual smart cards uh, issued out to their to, to their cohorts um, or CCGs, uh, um, and again, that's allowed uh, GPs to to um, access um, everything they need to access with virtual smart cards, um, or, um, whether it's on a fat PC or uh, on BDI, it hasn't mattered. Um, and then, if you like, more of a community sort of angle here, Berkshire Healthcare, uh, 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 a very large mental health trust, 
um, they, they use both our virtual smart card and also our mobile application. So basically making sure that um, uh, um, all of their staff can get access, in particular on the move, you know, when, when, when they're out seeing patients. Uh, you know, so again, a slightly different angle, but again, it's, it's, it's about making it just a bit easier for all of their users. Um, and what, what I think ISISEC recognizes is, you know, um, our um, NHS, uh, amazing NHS organizations, you know, we, we sometimes can't help them with their day job and it's a really tough job and it's even tougher right now. But if we can do something that makes their life just a little bit easier, that says, do you know what, I don't have to worry about this, I don't have to worry about that, then it's a job well done for us. So, so you know, we're, we're really proud of um, how we're helping NHS to sort of change uh, in terms of people getting getting access to systems. Um, you know, I just wanted to give you a, a, a fast overview of ISISEC. There's a whole load, obviously, on our website. We've, we've got a team of people there, always happy to help, even, you know, you know just a quick chat, you know, you know where, where we're always able to help and always willing to help. Uh, if anybody's got any questions now, happy to answer them. But, but again, thanks, thanks to our friends at Bytes for uh, asking us along today. Thank you very much, Michael. Thank you. Thank you for that. Um, I've had a couple of questions come through. If you've got any further questions, then do um, uh, type those in. I'll just run through those questions now. Uh, one question for the fast track service. Tra fast track service is funded as part of the N365 agreement. Um, and what does it do for us? Fast track is available. Um, it's essentially uh, sort of a paid for consultancy and we are a fast fast track partner for various types of Microsoft technologies for the N365 stack of applications then certainly if you're running on the local tenant then there's fast track services that we can provide to you on that um, shared tenant we're working with Microsoft on that because there are some um, things just technical issues we need to get over from that so we'll be able to confirm that hopefully very shortly uh, if you're on the shared tenant but in any case um, you know I remind you that there's a, a short survey at the end and so if you're, you're interested in the fast track service from it from it put that into the survey and what we'll do is we'll get your account manager to give you a call back and run through what your requirements are and how we can help you out with that um, just going through I think I've answered quite a few of these um, another question is the genuine Microsoft licensing included in the cost of the droplet software so that's just the droplet technologies itself um, Microsoft licensing is either uh, provided on a user basis or a device basis uh, so if it's on a device basis then that whole device is actually um, licensed if it's on a user basis then that user is licensed so generally um, you know the Microsoft licensing should be should already be there but again if you've got any specific questions around that around your use case um, put, put that in the survey and uh, our account manager will be able to get back to you on that one um, one for droplet or ISOSEC um, or, or um, uh, one for droplet here um, is the container independently IP addressable from the host PC we can do that that is an option in inside um, by default it's not but we have a a version of direct networking if if we uh, if we need to do that uh, the only case in which that's applicable usually is if an IP address is hard-coded into the application mm -hmm. um, and and therefore it needs a route back to uh, talk back to the container but yes we've got we've got options for that okay another question here um, so if I have a software that can run on XP only will I be able to compile it and run it on Windows 10 yes yes good answer <laughs> and then um, what happens if the service is if a service is run from within the container e.g. it listens on a particular port that is presented to the network as a port listening on the host device Michelle I think very much depends on the nature of the, the calls um, what all we do is take our network traffic that's generated inside the container and we relay that out onto the host device. So there mm -hmm. is a private communication channel between the container and the host device. So any communication that's usually needed back to the host device can usually go through that channel. Um, but what I would say is that we work closely with the customer to, to verify that solution, make sure that application works as expected. 
Okay. Um, one for Isosec here, uh, Michael. How long would a typical transition take from physical to virtual smart cards for, say, an organization of 4,000 staff? Yeah, um, 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 really good question. But the actual the actual issuance of the virtual smart cards is um, relatively easy. So basically, from a technology angle, how you get up, up uh, running with virtual smart cards is you know uh, uh, a matter of a, a week or a couple of weeks. Um, I think the the slightly more time consuming um, operational side is sort of how you manage sort of the uh, um, a migration program with 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 your staff, which is a little bit sort of up to each individual organization. But we've had organizations who who've um, rolled out sort of three, four, five thousand in 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 sort of a couple of months. It's 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 very much um, up to the customer as to how fast they want to roll it out, um, or they can have a a slower timetable. So you know, I guess the fastest answer is as fast as you want. Um, and we work with our customers to sort of, you know, to sort of help them through that process of, of, of um, how they get get the virtual smart cards out. Uh, I would just add one thing: uh, virtual smart card um, uses the same identity as a physical smart card. So basically, there's not a separate identity. So um, at a customer's own discretion, um, you you can have both. So someone is able to keep their physical uh, NHS um, um, smart card and their virtual smart card, um, and that helps. In, in some of the change over hearts and minds as well. So someone isn't, isn't having their physical smart card taken off them on day one. They can have both either for uh, a period of time or, um, or forever. So, you know, so basically we try and make it as easy as possible for, for, for that overall transition to happen. I'm sorry, that's a long answer to a simple question, but the best I can do. <laughs> um... And uh, one for Droplet. Um, does Droplet support containerization of applications in a multi-session solution? Um, yes, uh, we covered yes. that off with the Citrix um, yes. use case. So a big reference customer, BT, with that, where, yes, we can run in a multi-session environment. Great. Great. Uh, Microsoft licensing question, what is the, what if the host is, device is Apple or Android? Well, that depends on the actual um, uh, application license there. Generally, uh, when you're looking at the N365 products, they're licensed by user, um, and that enables you to have um, five, uh, five sessions running on a desktop, five instances running on a mobile device, five instances running on a tablet. So for those particular applications, that doesn't really um, matter. So the licensing would work there. Okay, thanks very much. I don't see any more questions yet. Um, if we do get some subsequently, that's great. If you want to ask a question, do fill in the survey. Very important you fill that in for us. Uh, enables us to, to uh, answer any specific questions you may have um, or any further support you want uh, following this webinar, uh, but also uh, gives us an indication of how uh, well we performed during this time. We really appreciate your time. We know it's a busy time for everybody at the moment, uh, considering what's going on. Um, but we hope you found this useful. Uh, keep an eye out for further webinars that we'll be doing, doing these regularly for the NHS. Um, and uh, yeah, thank you for your time. And thanks to all the presenters as well. Much appreciated. Thank you, Bites. Thank you. Thank, thank you, you Bites.